This weekend and two weeks from now, Pastor Brian is uh, doing weddings back in Ohio. Commitments that he had made uh, many months ago. And so it's my privilege to be with you uh, this weekend and in a couple of weeks. My, my, my name is uh, Tim, and uh, I had a privilege, the privilege in July and August to be with you for about six weeks, and it's just really good to be back at Lakeside. What I want to do today and in two weeks is take a look at uh, the Old Testament story of Jonah, who's a prophet of uh, God, and today and in two weeks, we're going to uh, unpack that whole book and try to draw from it some things that could be meaningful for us. Each time I've had opportunity to come to Lakeside, I have come without my wife. Uh, Anne would love to be here, but she and I are in a season of life right now where we're teaming up as a couple to care for my mom, who uh, is in Sturgeon Bay and is at near the end of her life, and needs a lot of care right now. Um, one day, I hope you can meet Anne. But this is, uh, this is a picture of Anne and I together uh, a year ago on Aspen Mountain. My wife, Anne, is the youngest of four sisters. The youngest of four sisters. Here's one of my favorite pictures of Anne and her sisters. Did I mention that Anne was the youngest sister? <laughs> By her own admission, Anne was a very strong-willed child. I'm happy to report that by God's grace, her three older sisters are reasonably well-adjusted <laughs> today. On one occasion in early elementary school, strong-willed Anne decided that she'd had enough at home. She packed a suitcase, then she took her packed suitcase to the backyard of the family home in Roseville, Minnesota. Her mom walked out to ask Anne what her plans were. And Anne said she planned to run away to her grandma's in Chicago. Her dilemma was she wasn't sure how to get to Chicago. Her mom listened with understanding and then asked if Anne might like some hot chocolate inside while figuring out the way to Chicago. Anne thought that was a good idea. So she came in and enjoyed her hot chocolate, and evidently, Anne decided to give her family another chance. <laughs> After drinking her cocoa, she unpacked her suitcase. Today, I try to keep a box of Swiss Miss in the pantry. <laughs> okay, here's why I share that story. It seems... It seems there's an impulse in many of us to simply run away when life isn't going the way we want it to go. Isn't that true? And I wonder if some of us have supposed that we could run away from God. It's possible to become disappointed if God doesn't show up the way you thought he should show up. So you run away from him. Or perhaps God has straightforwardly spoken into some area of your life and frankly, you disagree with him. You don't care that your perspective contradicts God's perspective and you run away from God. Or perhaps God has called you to an area of service that seems to you difficult or perhaps even inconvenient Frankly, it interferes with your plans. So you run. You run away from God. Remember that Burger King commercial from years ago? Have it your way at Burger King. We like having it our way. Isn't that true? Even in the way, friends, that we relate to God. We sort of want the king of kings to be more like Burger King. You know, we want God to do what we want him to do because we want it our way. 
So though he loves us with a crazy love, though he's disarmingly faithful, though he's already addressed our deepest needs at the cross of Jesus, at times we act as though we expect God's interests to be made subordinate or even secondary to ours. And when that doesn't happen, well, we may be tr- tempted to treat God with indifference or even contempt, and we run from him. God saw fit to include in the Bible a story of a man who supposed he could run from God. His name was Jonah. If you have a Bible with you, you could turn with me right now to the Old Testament book of Jonah. He was one of the minor prophets in the Older Testament. His book comes after Obadiah and before Micah. It's a book with four short chapters. And today we're going to look together at Jonah chapter 1. Today and in two weeks, we plan to take a look at Jonah's story that's recorded in this Old Testament book of Jonah. He could be fairly referred to as a reluctant prophet. This is what we read beginning at verse 1 of Jonah 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he'll take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who's responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you please. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to Him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This is a provocative story. A mission directive from God an unwilling messenger, a decision to run away from God, a frightening storm, and amazing mercy from God. As the story plays out. 
Friends, in reality, this is a story of grace and God's relentless pursuit of people. He loves to transform and restore people for his greater glory and for our greater good. This story is really more about God than it is about Jonah. And what we discover of God in this story is really humbling. His patience is astounding. His mercy is amazing. His commitment to his mission in the world is relentless. We discover in this story that there are times when God, in love, is real directive in his call to us. He occasionally designs directives that he presents to us that are not multiple choice. They're yes or no. Yes or no. And in this story, God poses a yes or no directive to Jonah. And Jonah's emphatic response to God was, no. What's stunning is the way that God patiently endures Jonah's reluctance while continuing to pursue Jonah with goodness and mercy. Besides this Old Testament book that bears his name, we meet Jonah in one other place in the Old Testament. He's mentioned in passing in 2 Kings 14.25. In that place, we're told that uh, Jonah was a prophet whose mission was to speak for God, that he was the son of a guy named Amittai, and that his home was a nondescript little town. In the context of that passage, we know that he lived, and this is significant, around 740 B.C. So his life is somewhere in there between 700 to 750 B.C. There's a few scant details about Jonah's biography that are known to us when we come to this book uh, that bears his name, Jonah. And as the book opens... God comes to Jonah with this very specific directive. Here it is again in verse 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. And that is not what the directive was. <laughs> so, uh, so if I might, uh, there, I did have it right. Sorry about that. No, that's wrong too. So let me just read it. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come before me. God says, go to Nineveh. Now, Jonah was understandably shaken by this directive. And this is where it's helpful to have just a little bit of historical context. Why was he so shaken by this directive? Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. In the 7th and 8th centuries B.C., Assyria was the great world superpower. The Assyrians were notorious for leveraging their power with brute force. They pulverized nations. In 722 B.C., the northern kingdom of Israel was captured and squashed by Assyria. Assyria was feared. The evil that this nation represented caused many in Israel to feel deep, deep hostility toward them. And Assyria's capital city was Nineveh. This is what a prophet named Nahum said about Nineveh in Nahum 1.1. Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. What a vivid picture of how Nineveh was viewed. Nahum, the prophet, winds up his entire prophetic indictment against Nineveh this way in the final verse of the book of Nahum. Nothing can heal your wound. Your injury is fatal. Everyone who hears the news about you claps his hands at your fall for who has not felt your endless cruelty? Mark it well, mark it well. In that day and at that time, 
people in Israel felt revulsion toward Nineveh. And Jonah felt that revulsion. He embraced that sentiment. And God says to Jonah, go to Nineveh. Specifically, God asked Jonah to go to Nineveh as God's messenger to confront the city with their wickedness and with God's corresponding displeasure. Now, in fairness to Jonah, we understand why his knees were knocking, why he had some white knuckles. You can almost hear Jonah pause and say, well, Lord, could I just send a Google Doc or an email memo? (laughs) Yet God persists, says to Jonah, go to Nineveh. And Jonah had a decision to make, didn't he? Now let's stop the story for a moment because this isn't simply a history lesson. I believe that God the Holy Spirit is in the room with us right now and He's here to speak to us now. It's very possible that some of you are here this morning and frankly you uh, are identifying very much with Jonah at this point. Specifically, you may be feeling a secret sympathy for him. You may relate to his hesitance about receiving a challenging directive from God. Somewhere deep in your own soul, you're aware of a prompting from God in the past. Or even recently, where God challenged you to step out in faith in some new way. And to trust him with what you couldn't see or didn't understand yet. And you put God off. What might there be today that God may perhaps be asking of you? Friends, believe me, I'm asking this question of myself. What might God be asking of us that might feel to us like our Nineveh. In Jonah's case, he became a runner. He says no to God. Now, I want very much for uh, you to be able to see on the screen uh, something of the significance of this. Joppa is, by the way, today it's Tel Aviv in Israel. It says that Jonah went down to Joppa to board a ship headed for Tarshish. Now, God had called him to go to Nineveh, which was 550 miles northeast. But Tarshish was 2,500 miles away to the west. I mean, it it, it, kind of says something, doesn't it? that Jonah wasn't just fleeing from God, he was getting as far from God and as far away from God's directive as he could possibly go. Tarshish today uh, is a part of what's called the Riviera. But Jonah wasn't going there so he could drink lemonade with the little umbrellas in the cup. (laughs) He was getting as far away from God as as he could go. Now let's step out of the story again for a moment and dare here, friends, let's go heart to heart. Perhaps many of us in this room can identify as Christians with a time when, for a variety of reasons, we may have knowingly run from God. Might happen like this. You become aware that God wants you to speak the truth in love to someone in your circle of influence But because you're not sure how they'd receive it, and because that could be hard and even unpleasant, you decide, I'll just run to Tarshish. Or maybe it looks like this. I know God wants me to confess to another believer an area of secret sin in my life. He wants me to be vulnerable and to live in the light and confess this to someone else. But I prefer to keep it covered up. So... I'll run to Tarshish. Or 
Or some of you might say, I believe God is calling me to forgive someone who's hurt me deeply. I know God wants me to forgive and not hold on to resentment. I know that in my spirit, but my pride persuades me to refuse to forgive. I want to be right. So I'll continue to nurse my bitterness and look for a ship to Tarshish. Or there might be someone here today who at some point may have sensed God tugging on you to explore, consider some kind of cross-cultural ministry, but it didn't seem to fit with your personal plan for your life, so you dismissed the tug from God and you headed for Tarshish. That's what Jonah did. I suppose he thought, I can run from God. No one will know. Friends, listen to me. But Jonah knew, and God knew. In resilient love and severe mercy, God kept pursuing Jonah. Friends, I hope we don't miss that. God is not some oppressive tyrant trying to wreck our lives. He was after Jonah because he loved him and he wanted to show Jonah an unexplainable expression of his power and his might in Nineveh. But Jonah didn't want to go and we'll think more about that in a couple of weeks. Graciously, God invites us to follow him into challenges we wouldn't choose because he's aiming to display to us more of his glory, more of his power, and more of his grace. Beautifully, God wants to show us more of who he is. And honestly, friends, listen, aren't you glad that God hangs on to us and doesn't simply write us off when we ignore or resist his directives? He doesn't discard us. Aren't you glad? I stand before you as one who's just amazed that through the course of my life, God kept pursuing me at points when my pride did this. God is patiently yet persistently pursuing you. And here's the deal. God was very much at work in Jonah in this story. We see the patience of God, the power of God, and we see that the purpose of God is not going to be thwarted. Here's what God does in severe mercy after Jonah was thrown overboard into a raging Mediterranean sea. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, I'm sure he lost his taste for sushi. (laughs) But the truth was, God saved his life. Now, this story is not ultimately about the big fish. This story is about God. The God who we've come to worship this morning the God who we're here to to respond to, the strong and amazing Redeemer God of mercy and steadfast love who pursues and rescues and works to reorient even reluctant servants like Jonah, dare I say it, friends, like us. While the story involves what happens inside the big fish, the story is more concerned what happened inside Jonah. It's personal. It's transformational. God was personally speaking to Jonah and reorienting his life through that perilous visit to Shamu Inn and Suites. God loved Jonah and he was preparing to save him and restore him. This is what just is so, this is so mind-blowing to me. God did not discard Jonah. 
I really hope we see that, friends. And in this story, we certainly have overtones of the gospel and how the grace of God has been expressed for us in and through Jesus Christ. It was Jesus himself who referenced this story, the story of Jonah, in Matthew 12, 40. Here's what Jesus said in looking ahead to his own sacrifice. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In other words, now think about this. Just as Jonah was thrown overboard on behalf of others, Jesus came to be thrown overboard on our behalf. And just as Jonah being thrown overboard ended a raging storm that saved the lives of those who were on that ship, so Jesus being thrown overboard caused calms the raging storm of enmity between us and God because of our rebellion and because of sin that separates us from Him. And just as Jonah was delivered and alive on shore after being presumed dead and gone, so Jesus was raised from the dead after being presumed dead and gone. He came, he lived, he died according to plan, and he rose from the dead, and he's alive and reigning today. He is Savior, he is Lord. There's there's overtones of the gospel in this story of Jonah, and that's why Jesus made reference to it in his own life and ministry. Why would God do all of this for us? Why was he so resolved to take the initiative himself and make a way for runners like us to be reconciled to him? And friends, this is the message of the Bible. He loves us. That's why he did it. He loves us with a crazy, amazing, staggering love. He desires relationship with him. And in the context of that relationship, he desires to not only work in us, but friends, what he wants to do is work through us to touch the world around us that needs his transformational touch and his redeeming love. It's amazing grace. In a couple weeks, we plan to look at the rest of the story, and we're going to be powerfully reminded that people matter to God. People matter to God. All kinds of people matter to God. For now, by His grace, I want for myself and I want for you to with fresh resolve choose to run to God rather than from God. Father in heaven, God, I thank you for Lakeside Church. I thank you for the people that you've called together in this place. God, uh, I believe that you have uniquely and strategically positioned this fellowship to be salt and light on the lake shore. This whole region. From Sturgeon Bay to Kiwani and beyond. Algoma to Luxembourg and beyond. Father, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would be work in, at work in each of us right now. God, perhaps uh, convicting us where we have had a tendency to run from you, encouraging us to run to you, and God, uh, expectant with hope that you are going to show us more of yourself, more of your power, more of your grace as we're 
near you, saying yes to your directive. In Jesus' name, amen.